This is a recording of Nectar in a Sieve by Kamala Markandeya. Chapter 24 I took down the mats on which we slept from the wall where they hung and rolled them up. Inside I placed the cloth bundle which contained two olives of rice, some chilies, tamarind and salt, and the wooden bowls, Nathan's and mine, tying the ends of the rolled mats to make sure nothing fell out on the way. Most of the cooking vessels I had brought with me on my marriage had been sold to pay our debts. Of the remainder, I left two for Ira, and the other two I put aside for ourselves. The grindstone, pestle, and mortar were too heavy to take. In any case, my daughter-in-law would be providing these. My cooking days are over, I thought a little sadly, and suddenly what I had formerly performed without thought, or even with impatience, the gathering of fuel, and the blowing of the fire, and the waxing of the flames under the steaming pot, with all the business of smoke down the lungs and in the eyes, acquired a sweet and piercing poignancy. There would be meals to cook on the journey. However, since we were traveling by bullock cart and expected to be on the road at least two days, and for these I took the handmade bellows and six cakes of dung. Under the granary floor our money lay buried, three rupees of our own, three that Selvan had given us out of his earnings, and a ten rupee note that Kenny had sent through Selvam. When everything was done, I took out the money, counted it, and tucked it in securely at my waist. Then we were ready. The morning of our departure comes. It is still a morning, hazy, dewy, for it is yet early. The bullock cart lumbers up, the bells around the animals' necks jangling. They have tiny bells fixed to caps on the tips of their horns, too, which tinkle as they move. The cart is piled high with bales of tightly packed skins, for we are passengers on a return journey. But there is room enough for two. We clamber on. Selvam hands us the two or three bundles we are taking with us, which we hold on our laps until the carter tells us to stow them on top of the bales. We do so carefully. Then it is time to go. Selvam steps back. Ira comes forward from the courtyard where she has been standing. She is holding her son by the hand. The three of them stand in line waiting to see us on our way. The carter flicks both bullocks with his whip. The animals strain forward. The cart gives a lurch. Nathan holds out his hands. Our children bow their heads. Then we begin to move, and the three of them come after us a little of the way. Walking in the dust, the wheels grind out of the earth until the bullocks begin to trot and they fall back. The bullocks have found their own rhythm now, moving so that their hooves strike the earth together and the yoke is borne steadily on their shoulders. We are traveling fast. The hut, its inhabitants, recedes behind us and yet in front of us, for we are sitting with our backs to the bullocks. Our beloved green fields fall away to a blur. The hut becomes a smudge on the horizon. Still, we strain our eyes to pierce the reddish dust the wheels throw up. We are further away with every turn of the wheels. I stare at them fascinated until the spokes begin to revolve backwards while the rim is inexorably borne forward. I feel dizzy. My throat is dry. I lean against my husband. He is already leaning on me. Together we achieve a kind of comfort. The carter is asleep on his jointed perch. The bullocks know the route well. They keep on without guidance from him. At midday, we halt near a small wayside well. The carter wakens, snorts, stretches himself before climbing down. We are to eat here, he says, 
and he unyokes the bullocks to water them. I see one of them has a large raw patch on its shoulder where the yoke has rubbed the skin off. The animal is not well, I say to the man. He shrugs. What can I do? I have no other. I must make these trips since they are my livelihood. We wash, eat, wash again, then proceed. Mile after mile of dusty road stretching out straight before us, lined here and there with cool shady banyans or tamarind trees. The bullock with the sore patch is slowing the other up. The carter turns, impatient and brings out his whip. It is no use. Its pace does not alter. We pass another bullock carts, are passed by some eat again, sleep again. At night we stop while the carter lights the lantern slung beneath the cart. Then we move on in the darkness and the small yellow light disc travels with us like a comforting beacon. On and on and on and on we journey. The cart driver roused us when we reached the outskirts of the city where my son worked. It was mid-afternoon. The sun was streaming down hot and at its most powerful. Here you are. This is as far as I can take you. He nudged Nathan, who sat with his head lolling against the bales fast asleep. I shook him, pushing his head erect. Wake up, we have arrived. He opened his eyes, reddened, and with drooping lids. I could easily sleep the whole day through, he said, yawning and stretching. We are late already, the carter was grumbling. I should have got here by morning. If only this bullock had kept better pace. He leaped down and lifted the yoke preparatory to watering his animals. The raw patch on the bullock I had noticed had begun to fester more skin, had been eaten away, and trickles of blood were running down the edges. This animal will soon be fit for nothing, he muttered to himself. Heaven knows when I shall be able to afford another. As soon as the animals had drunk, he put the yoke back. The bullock cringed, but accepted the torment, and as soon as the whip fell, it began to pull again. The carter leaned from his perch to call to us, his face hot and perspiring. Good luck, friends. Keep well. His voice was friendly. Goodbye. Good luck, we called back. For a little while, we stood by the roadside, our parcels about us. There were three turnings before us, and there was no telling which way lay the house of our son. Then Nathan picked up the mats. Come along, we may meet somebody soon. We chose a road at random, walked for some time without seeing anyone. We should have asked the carter, I thought. He would have known, but I did not say so. At length we saw two men approaching, jogging along towards us with bundles on their heads. Can you direct us to Coil Street, friend? Coil Street? Uh, let me see. He put up his hand to scratch his head, but the burden being there withdrew it. No, I cannot. Brother, can you tell these people what they want to know? His companion thought, I have heard of it. Yes, I remember now. It is in one of the suburbs of the town, quite away from here, but this is the right road. How far? About 15 miles. If you keep to the road, you may get a lift, he added good-naturedly, seeing our crestfallen faces. We plodded on. Several bullock carts passed us and one or two jackets, but none stopped. Most of them were fully laden already. The bundle I carried, for all that it contained so little, grew heavier with each step. My neck was stiff with the effort of holding my head steady, for the bundle was poised on top. Under each arm was a cooking pot. Whenever the sweat came trickling down, which happened frequently, it was a hot day, 
I had to stop and put them down before wiping my face. My husband, similarly burdened, had troubled more than I was by flies and insects, had also to stop frequently, so our going was slow. As we progressed, the road broadened. It split and forked. Other roads curled away from it, and more came to intersect it, so that it was difficult to know whether we were keeping to the right road or not. Many people were about, walking quickly and intent on their business. We did not find it easy to stop and ask them the way. Not only people, but traffic, bullock carts, jackas, cars and bicycles more than we had ever seen, many times thicker than in the town around the tannery. The noise never let up. Car horns, bicycle bells, and the cracking of whips combined to produce a deafening, bewildering clamor, amid which is was impossible to heed every warning sound. Several times we were nearly knocked down by impatient cyclists whose bells we had not heard. Once, a jaka almost ran us over. The driver just managed to pull up the horse, and while we stood palpitating, he leaned from his seat, irate and frightened, to shout at us. His voice was very loud, and he shook his fist as he drove off. Several people stopped to stare at us curiously as we hurried on. We had reached the city center. Coyle Street lay some six miles away and we were still not sure of finding it. I could see Nathan was very tired. The heat and the noise, the bustle of the city had taken their toll. He was walking sluggishly now, and again he stumbled. And at last I said, Let us rest for a while. It will do us both good. He agreed at once. We found a quieter side street, and thankfully, putting our burdens beside us, sank down. No one paid any attention to us. We were allowed to sit there in peace. We had bought on the way a hand of plantains, of which four remained. And as we had not eaten since morning, I brought these out, giving two to my husband and eating two myself. It was nearly dusk. The activities of the city were beginning to die down. The noise was decreasing. Soon, streetlights were winking, and in the shops, gas lamps and hurricane lanterns were lightening up. But in the little side alley where we sat, it was dark, darker than the air and the sky above us, from the shadows cast by the buildings on either side. It was such a relief to rest, and the thought of continuing the search was so unwelcome that we sat on while the gloom thickened and night crept up on us. When at last we rose, stars were bright in the sky. We have stayed too long, I thought uneasily. We shall not reach our sun tonight. Nathan did not seem too happy either. As we stood there undecided, our bundles spread about us, wondering what to do. An old man whom I had noticed asleep in a doorway came up to us. Where do you go, friends, at this late hour? To Coyle Street. Our son lives there. We are going to him. That is a long way yet. You look tired. We have rested too well. We should have been on our way long since. Well, if you do not arrive tonight, there is a temple not far from here where you can eat and sleep, he pointed. In the distance, we saw the outline of a temple, not too distant, however, with a yellow oil flare burning from the top. We looked, and it seemed to beckon to us, promising food and shelter. We are grateful to you. Perhaps it would be best. We are tired, as you say. We picked up our possessions and walked on, more firmly now that we had somewhere definite to go, helped by the yellow flare that burned so steadily ahead of us. As we neared the temple, we noticed several people, mostly old and crippled, going the same way. Obviously, many of them were known to one another, 
for as they hobbled along in ones and twos and sometimes small groups, they exchanged greetings and news. They knew us at once for strangers, perhaps by the bundles we carried, but were not disposed to be unfriendly for that, and they smiled to us, and one or two called out cheerfully, Are you bound for the temple too? Yes, we hope to shelter there for the night. Are you going to settle in this city? Yes, our son lives here. He is married and we are going to stay with him. His name is Marugan, we said eagerly. Maybe you have heard of him? No, no, they shook their heads indulgently. Oh, well, it is a big city. In the precincts of the temple, shops and stalls were open, brightly lit with gas lamps with their owners standing or sitting within and calling out their wares to passers-by. But most had no money to spend. At one shop, pilas were being sold, mounds of saffron rice on buttered plantain leaves, glistening with ghee and garnished with red chilies and curling strips of fried onion. The smell from it, rich and tempting, swirled up with the puffs of steam from the boiling rice. Impossible to shut it out, useless to try. The fragrant smell was everywhere. I felt a cramp beginning in my stomach, held it with an effort that turned me giddy. When it had passed, the familiar symptoms of nausea began. Nathan pressed my arm in sympathy. He too looked queasy. Through the outer courtyards and along the corridors we went, going with the crowd to whom this was evidently a nightly routine, and into a large vaulted chamber with arched entrances opening on three sides. Here we stopped and sat down to wait with the rest on the stone floor. In the dark inner chamber, the god and goddess were seated on their thrones, freshly anointed and garlanded with flowers. At their feet were piled beetle leaves, rice, and a host of sweet meats. A woman sitting beside me nudged and pointed. The food is given to the poor to us, and when it has been blessed... There is a lot tonight, she added. You are lucky. I saw her sucking her lips in anticipation. After a while, two priests with half-shaven heads entered. One carried a beaker full of water, the other a tray of more votive offerings, which they placed at the feet of the god. Bells began to tinkle. At their sound, the priest began intoning the prayers one taking up where the other left off. Everyone was standing, most of them with hands folded and closed eyes. I closed my eyes too, pressing my hands over them. The eyeballs felt hot under the lids. I could see beneath them a black-rimmed orange glow against which floated the images of the past. My son's Ira, the hut where we lived and the fields we had worked. The more I banished them, the faster they came. I saw old Granny again, toothless and wrinkled. Kenny, his eyes sorrowful when I told him we were going. Sacrabani's face, white and scarred as it often was. I tried and tried, concentrating on the prayers that were being said. And at last the images faded. I saw in their place the countenance of the god and his consort, and it seemed to me that they looked on me benignly, and I was at length able to pray. All about me was a deep, intense silence, and in it I heard my prayer, voiceless, wordless, rising up and up endlessly like the incense which burnt perpetually upon the altar. And when at last I opened my eyes, the silence which had enfolded me had given place to a pervasive murmur, the sound from the suppliant lips and beseeching throats of the multitude. A drum struck savagely through the hush, sent it shivering, flying. 
people blinked and stared, called thus rudely to take up their ordinary existence. One of the priests began to sprinkle holy water, people maneuvering to get near the precious drops. The other was handing out the food to a third man, and as soon as this was done, the gilded doors of the inner chamber were closed. Almost at once the people began moving to the courtyard, which opened from the assembly hall. The food will be distributed there, a woman whispered to me. There is not always enough to go around. It is best to be first. A lot of the people had had the same idea and were jockeying energetically for position. The murmuring silence gave. The crowd burst into loud clatter. It was as if the thought of food had loosened all tongues and the pushing and thrusting became more violent. The friendliness that had existed before was gone. Men and women struggled to be in the forefront, fighting their way with ferocity, thrusting forward with strident urgency. I found myself in the middle of the throng. Nathan had got separated, and looking round, I saw him on the outward fringe among the very old and crippled. He had never been one for pushing. Well, I thought. I can tell them my husband is here and take two portions. Then I saw two men enter, bringing the food, and all other thoughts seized. Craning my neck and body, standing on tiptoe, I saw the cauldrons they carried. Cauldrons of rice heaped high and showing white gleaming peaks from which wisps of steam issued, and pots filled with a mixture of dal and vegetables which sent forth a most savory smell. From a pile beside him, one of the men took out a plantain leaf, not a whole one, but cut into pieces twice the size of a man's hand. On this he ladled out two spoonfuls of rice. The other filled a small cup, made from dried leaves held together with thorns, with the dull mixture. From the crush one man at a time, as much by pressure as by his own efforts, was ejected, like the palm leaf stopper of a fo foaming toddy pot, collected his portion, drank of the holy water, and made his way out. My turn came. The level of the rice was already fallen so low that it was only by going close to the vessel that I could see any rice at all. One of the men rebuked me sharply. Keep your distance. Do you want to devour pot and all? I must ask for my husband, I thought, and found myself quaking. The plantain leaf was handed to me, the rice placed on top, then the cup of doll. Now... If you will be so kind, sir, I said, I will take my husband's portion as well on my leaf. They gaped at me, surprised, affronted. The woman is mad, one called out, expects a double portion. Not satisfied with one, the other rejoined in an offended voice, but must try and make capital out of charity. I do not, I said, I have a husband and he is here. I ask only for his portion. If he is here, let him come, and we will serve him in his turn. We cannot hand out food to everyone merely because they ask for it. Do you take us for fools? Keep your tails for the unwary, cried one, and the other called out impatiently. Hurry up, hurry up. Do you want to keep us standing here all night? I went, taking my food with me. Those who had been served were sitting in the open a little way off eating, and I joined them. Perhaps I looked dejected, for one of the women said consolingly, They were sharp-tongued tonight. Probably they were tired. You must not mind. There was a murmur of assent, except from one man who said in a hostile voice, Well, they are right. Everyone must come in his turn, or who is to know the truth from a lie when people ask for more than one portion? And again, from the easily swayed crowd, came a murmur of agreement. I must justify myself in the eyes of these people. 
I thought forlornly, and I said, I spoke the truth. My husband is here. See, he is coming to me. As I saw him approach, I also saw that his hands were empty. Still, it was good to share what there was and eat. Good to have food in the belly. Good to feel the dizziness replaced by well-being. When we had finished, we threw the empty leaves to the goats that had gathered, expectant but patient for their meal. And that, too, was a satisfying thing, to see them eating leaves and cups, crunching them in their mouths with soft, happy movements, and looking at us with their mild, benign eyes. Then we went and washed our hands under the running tap, rinsing mouth and face as well in the cool water, and came back ready for sleep. It was only then that we remembered, with trepidation, our bundles. We had left them propped against one of the carved stone pillars in the long corridor leading to the assembly hall. We went to it, but the bundles had vanished. Perhaps our memory is at fault. Maybe it is not this particular stone pillar, but another. There are so many, and one is like another, I thought. To the next, and the next, and the next, there were hundreds of pillars and columns, and we went to them all with fast dying hope. Three or four had seen us searching. Three or four more joined these. Soon a small crowd of advisors and helpers followed at our heels. Are you sure it was this hall of pillars? There is another on the west side of the temple. Quite sure. We have not been on the other side. How could they? said a scornful voice. That side is locked at night. Who was looking after the bundles? No one, no one. We left them unattended. Unattended? Looking for trouble, that was. There are many thieves and strangers about these days. What? Even in a temple? We did not think. Yes, even in a temple, of course. Many kinds come here, and there can be no guarantee of their honesty. It appears not, Nathan said heavily. Our possessions have gone. There was a futility only in further searching, further weariness. We gave up and leaned our backs against the painted wall which encircled the temple. The vermilion and white striped wall we had foolishly, foolishly thought meant safety. The promise of shelter had been kept, however food and somewhere to sleep. At least the loss is not irreparable, Nathan said. We have our money still. The pots and matting can be replaced. Best not to speak of it, I said, feeling cautiously for the money in my waistband, the coins hard and comforting to my touch. We must be careful. He smiled wryly. After the horse has bolted, but I could not smile, and the ease with which he accepted the misfortune irritated me. Now I shall be wholly indebted to my daughter-in-law, I thought. I go to her without even a cooking vessel, like any beggar off the streets, and straight away I determined to spend one or two of the coins I felt digging into my flesh at the nearest bazaar, for I would not go to her destitute. Soothed a little by the thought, I drifted into sleep. Broken often by bells ringing and the low rat-tat of drums for the prayers, which went on at intervals throughout the night. Once in my half-sleep, it seemed to me someone was tugging at my arm. But when I woke, it was only Nathan clutching at me in his sleep. I dozed off again. And after a while, I felt a soft fumbling about my face, noiseless like fingers on spindle cotton. I strove to wake to brush aside those pathetic flutterings, but strive as I would, I could not. At last I sat up, sleep and dream alike vanished, wide awake now. And whether from the fact of sleeping in new surroundings or from the loss we had sustained, I was unable to sleep again. 
I leant against that same wall by which we had laid ourselves down, watching the wind play with the yellow flare on top of the temple, looking into the darkness, which varied its pitch from point to point. Gradually, I was able to make out the forms of the carven gods and goddesses on the sides of the temple, on the columnades, and in the niches of the walls, and as I gazed, they seemed almost to live, their stone breasts gently breathing, their limbs lightly moving. Nearly, nearly could I believe what I saw, sitting there in the darkness by the temple wall. Until dawn, when the stars went out one by one, and the gray lights changed the sculptured figures back into immobility.